This video is a strategy guide on how to increase your point total in the fun and exciting meeple placement game known as Everdell. The first thing I want to note is that when you're playing Everdell, you are competing for resources with the other players. So as an example, there are locations present in the game in which you will place your meeple on. And, you know, in this case, this location, since it has a complete circle around it and there's no gap in it, means that only one meeple can be placed in that location. It's extremely important and imperative that when you're placing your meeples, you get the most resources out of them. You only have a very limited amount um, over the course of the game, and at most, you're going to have six toward the end of the game. But when you're first starting out, you're only going to have those two meeples to get your city going. So be really careful and cognizant of those sort of like standard locations. Once somebody has locked one out, you won't be able to take it. As a general note, when you are placing your meeples at the beginning of the game, the forest locations usually offer more resources per meeple than the standard locations uh, that I just showed you previously. So be very, very uh, aggressive when it comes to placing your meeples, especially at the beginning of the game. If you're playing only a two or three person game, you will only be able to access one of these um, little locations on these forest cards. If you have four players or more, you can actually access both. So be really mindful, take those up first and foremost. Uh, be aggressive with that, take it, and when the season changes, be open to who has removed their meeples from those locations because they will open up and it will allow you to place your meeple instead. As a general note for the game, one of the best strategies is to continue your seasons as long as possible by getting resources back. So that's the name of the game. This is a resource management game. What you're looking for are cars in general in which it gives you something back. So when you purchase it, it's going to give you some sort of advantage or a discount, let's say, on the next card you play, something along those lines. So be really cognizant of that. When you first get the game going, focus on resources and gaining resources, not necessarily the high point totals. I think where a lot of players get a little bit confused, they'll see some of these cards like the Evertree or the King, and they think, wow, I really got to place that thing out as soon as possible uh, to get those points. But what you're really looking for, especially at the beginning of the game, is to build up sort of an engine that gives you resources turn and turn and time and time again. Um, so specifically, you're going to be looking for those green production cards, and those cards will have uh, the little leaf sort of curled over on the card. These are the most common and frequent cards in Everdell. The vast majority of the cards really fall into this green category. I mean, roughly looks like half the deck is actually these green cards. So start building on your opening turn those green cards. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some combos and some stuff that you can do to really get this going. If I mention the term frequency throughout this video, that's going to denote how many copies of a given card exist in the Everdell deck. This is just the basic version of the game. I don't have any of the extra cards uh, in this deck currently for, let's say, Pearlbrook. So what we're going to do is just focus on the core set for this video. I'm going to talk about this strategy. It is one of the easiest ways to sustain very, very long seasons and it's by using two different cards. The first one is the shopkeeper. And what's fantastic about this, you get one berry after you play a critter. So you're getting something back no matter what critter you're playing onto the table. So that's a fantastic way to sustain your turn even further. You're constantly getting a resource back. Almost think of it as it's kind of like one less to play a critter. That's not necessarily the case because you always have to have all of those resources to play it but you're getting something back every time you play a critter. The second card is the Historian, and it allows you to draw a card after you play a critter or a construction. Now, if you get both of these out, uh, typically on the first season, you can sustain really long season turns in which you're getting cards back into your hand and you're getting a resource back. So I highly recommend these two cards if you can get them out early. The sooner the better. If you can get them out on your first season when you're playing winter, that's when you really need to get them out. So be on the lookout for these. The frequency of these are both three. So that what that means is there's only three of these in the deck. 
Uh, if you're playing a four-player game, not everybody will be able to get them. This is one of the basic fundamentals of Everdell. One of the best ways to put critters out is for free. And you can do that by the bottom right-hand corner of the card has an icon. And in this case, it's the husband or the wife. And to play out the card for free, you simply place this door token on the bottom uh, corner of the card, and then you can play uh, this critter for free. Now, when you're doing this, I'm going to recommend that you always pull from the meadow. The meadow represents a collective uh, set of cards that all of the other players are vying and fighting over. If you can take a card out of the meadow, you are essentially denying one of your opponents that card and the ability to use it. I can't tell you how many times that when you're playing a game, especially like a four, five, or six player game, if you have Belfair, um, when you're playing this, people want those cards that are out of the meadow. So to give yourself a competitive advantage over your opponents, always try to play the cards out of the meadow. In addition to that, um, the cards that you have in your hand, you can use for other things over the course of the game. Sometimes you can discard them. It gives you a little bit more um, play and leeway. Especially, you're not wasting a card from your hand as well. So that gives you almost a resource. I want you to think of the cards in your hand almost as like a secondary resource in this case. So during the course of the game, be always on the lookout for if you have a uh, construction out, look for the corresponding critter as it's cycling around the table. It gives you a lot of points, it's really easy to do, and you don't spend one resource on that, so that's a really fantastic deal. Here's another strategy and it works extremely well. Whenever the crane or the innkeeper comes out on the table, I recommend buying it and buying it as soon as possible. If it's in the meadow, take it and play it. When you put these cards out, they kind of have the same effect. You can uh, remove it from the game and put it into the discard pile. And for the crane, you can build a construction and the construction will cost three less wild resources and that gives you a lot of latitude on what you play. So think of it as almost like a three for one. It does cost a pebble, which is a little bit pricey, but you can play those bigger constructions out very quickly, very effectively by just spending one pebble. And oftentimes those bigger constructions use multiple pebbles. So think of it as the, the most difficult resource in the game to get is the pebble. And this allows you to essentially trade that in for up to three other pebbles. There's numerous cards let's say the palace or the ever tree that costs three pebbles. So this is a great way to do it. The other one is the innkeeper. So you can use this to play down critters for uh, even cheaper, which is fantastic. A lot of the critters kind of top out, you know, around, you know, two to three-ish resources. You don't see a lot of them that really go over that. Um, obviously the king and the queen, they're very expensive. And then you also have things like the doctor and these are all high point cards. So you can use the innkeeper and throw it into the discard pile and get something back in return. So if we're talking about sustaining your turn longer, you buy something and then you get more resources out of it. This is These two cards are prime examples of this and it keeps your season going even longer. Another combo that I really like specifically with the crane, there's a very expensive um, card and it is the architect. And I can't tell you how many times that this works is you play the crane out, then you can play on a subsequent turn the architect down, which gives you essentially two points at the end of the game and you get some extra bonuses at the very end. Then what you can do is you destroy the crane and bring something else out. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the synergy work over the course of the game. So if you see the crane or you see the innkeeper, purchase them right away, they are well worth it. This is probably the most frequent and common combo uh, there's eight farms in the deck, and there's four wives and there's four husbands in the normal play deck. So the odds of you getting this uh, out is very, very easy, very effective. The farm itself is great. It gives you a berry when you bring it out. Also, when you have harvest time during spring and autumn, so you get those resources again. In conjunction with that, if you put a husband card into play, that will give you kind of a wild resource if paired with the wife, which is fantastic. And then at the very end of the game, the wife is going to be worth five points. She's worth a normal two, but if paired with the husband, you get an extra three points. So always be on the lookout for the farm, husband, and wife combo. 
very rarely will you play a game of Everdell where you don't want to include this. Uh, it's a very easy way to gain a lot of points and, and some resources. The other thing that's great is that you can stack these two cards in the city so it doesn't take up as much space. So you're not going to be eating into your 15 cards nearly as bad if you have this combo out, so I recommend it. This is another fun combo in Everdell, and this deals with the chip sweep and the storehouse. When you bring the storehouse out, it gives you four different options on resources you can place onto the storehouse, and then at a later time, you can place a meeple on the storehouse to clear out all of those resources. The best way to use the storehouse is to let it fill up and then pull those resources out in autumn. Another thing that you can do is activate the storehouse multiple times so you can do it during spring and you can also do it, do it during autumn and add additional resources onto it so the more times you add resources onto the storehouse without putting a meeple onto it it makes that meeple when you do place it onto the card worth a ton of resources um, typically when i play the storehouse i get at least three different additions of resources to the storehouse before I pull it. I've even done it four times, um, and sometimes you can even do it five times if you get a chip sweep out early enough in the game and the storehouse early out in the game. And you get a ton of resources coming off that, especially sort of late game in your autumn season. So these two cards are really potent and powerful together, and I highly recommend pairing them together to really build up a lot of resources. The next combo I want to talk about uses the Dungeon card. Now this is a card that when I'm playing Everdell, not many people play it. They look at it and they say, oh, I don't really want that in my city because it doesn't have any points on it. So one of the great things that you can do with the Dungeon is you can get rid of things from your city, so critters specifically from your city and get resources back from them. One really fun combo is um, you know, somebody plays a fool on you, and you would normally take a minus two to your point total at the end of the game. In addition to it, the fool takes up one of your 15 locations in your city build. So it's kind of like, a you know, getting punched in the face twice by the fool. There is nothing more fun, though, to put the dungeon down, and then you can take the fool and throw it into the dungeon and get resources back from it. It's a great thing to do, and your opponent's honestly get a little bit angry when they see it because they think, haha, I've really, you know, locked you up with the fool. And what you do is you lock up the fool instead in a dungeon. Another cool thing that you can use with the dungeon is there's um, a fair number of these cards that only trigger once when they're brought out, and the bard is no exception. Now, notice that the bard is worth zero points, so after it triggers its ability, it basically just takes up space in your city, and you don't really need to have it out on the table. So another thing you can do with those zero cost or really low cost um, critters per se, you can throw them in the dungeon and recycle them and get some resources back when you're playing a construction or a critter. So this is a great card. A lot of people just overlook the dungeon because it has a zero victory point total on it. But think of it as you're, you can recycle stuff that you really don't need and you can get resources out of it. So it's a really fun combo. Similar to the dungeon, the ruins is a great card that you can use to recycle those constructions that you really don't need anymore. The dungeon, you know, it, it's kind of fun, it's useful. If you have the ranger out, you can use it twice and recycle two of your critters. But once the dungeon is all filled up, you can go ahead and recycle it using the ruins. So you can get rid of that card and then get the points back from it. The only bad thing about the ruins is it does take up a spot in your city but you can recycle some of those cards that you really don't need to use anymore. Cemetery is another one, which it's fun to play, but I don't know really how many times you need to do that in a game. It does take up a spot in your city, um, and it does take a meeple to activate the ability. So think of the ruins as a, as a good way to recycle and get rid of some of those unwanted constructions, and you can get some points out of it. So what's great about this is that think of it as um, just because buildings are in your city, they don't have to stay there. And a lot of people get really hung up on that. They're like, oh, once it's here, it's just here. So think a little bit outside the box. Think three-dimensionally and say, you know what? No, things don't have to stay here. I can swap them out or essentially trade them out. I'm getting rid of something, and then I'm going to put something into my city that is worth more points. 
The University is a great card recycling sort of action that you can perform. This is not open, which means that only you can place your meeple on this card once you have the University out in play. You can get rid of a critter or a construction from your city. Now think about some of those other cards that we've talked about already, that they have zero point value. You're not going to get anything from them over the course of the game, especially at the end of the game. So recycle them with the university to get those resources. You also get a wild resource and a victory point from it. So this is a great way to uh, trash out some of those cards, get all of the resources back and a little bit extra. So the university is extremely effective. In conjunction with that, you can play the doctor down for free. <clears throat> the doctor's special ability is you can give berries to gain a victory point. Now, that's kind of okay and it's better late game when you have a big stock and resource of berries. Otherwise, it's not the greatest. But the one advantage to it is it has four victory points on it. So this combo is pretty decent. Use the university first and foremost, and then you can just place the doctor down. For the victory points, the special ability on it is okay. Uh, it's not the greatest. Two really resource effective cards are the courthouse and the judge. Now, even if you have only one of these out, they're, they're beneficial. Oftentimes when you play the game, if you're really watching what's going on, you can get them both out if you do it quickly, um, especially if you're playing a lot of the cards from the meadow. The frequency of the courthouse is only two in the deck, but the judge, there's four copies in the deck. So if you can get a hold of one of the courthouses, you can kind of wait and let the meadow cycle a little bit and you can play that for free. Um, it is a little bit pricey, the judge. It's worth a decent number of victory points, but these are great cards when you're playing constructions. Um, specifically, if you have them both out, they can trigger and you can really make it more cost effective to put out a construction and then you get a resource back when you play it. So this is a great way to sustain those longer turns. It's a really easy thing to do and they're worth a decent amount of points, like two victory points each. That, that's not bad, especially for what they do. As I mentioned before, resource generation is the key to this game. These three cards are best played early on in the game. The mine is fantastic, especially it's going to be generating pebbles. And what's great about that is they're very hard to get. A lot of the pebble locations on the map, you only get one pebble from it. And it's one of those locations where only one meeple can go on it per season. And the meeple has to vacate it before another meeple goes down. Mine is very, very critical, often to success and victory, in my opinion. The Resin Refinery, I think it's, it's an okay sort of average card to have out. And if you have it early on in the game, it does produce the resin, which is great. The Twig Barge, I think it, it's okay. Wood is pretty easy to get in the game. And I don't really see, you know, a huge benefit to having that one out. It is pretty cheap. It only gives you one victory point. So if you really want to go for one of these three early on in the game, I would suggest going for the mine. Here's some sort of end game cards. These are something that you're going to play late in the game. Sometimes I see people play out the monastery early on in the game and the monk. I don't think they really help you all that much early on in the game, but they're really great cards to have out in the autumn, specifically the monastery. And this one is a little bit um, confusing. Once you put a worker on this card, it stays there. So you really don't want to bind up one of your workers until the last turn because you want them to come back and you want to be able to spend them in future seasons. So be really careful of playing the monastery. I would recommend never playing it until it's autumn, period. And the monk is also interesting as well. So you can potentially give your opponents resources, but they can use those resources to score points. So where you really want to use that is more toward the end of the game where people sometimes have an excess of certain resources and it doesn't matter all that much. Now, if you start giving somebody two berries early on in the game, it's a lot more impactful. So just be really careful and cautious when you're doing that. Also too, at the very beginning of the game, you don't want to be spending your berries giving them to other people for um, just a meager two points, two victory points. So be really careful with these. So I highly recommend don't even touch these cards until you hit the autumn. There are a handful of cards that I don't typically play, and a couple of them have a similar theme. For example, the Shepherd 
is a card that you can play. And when you're playing the Shepherd, it's kind of strange. When you pay for it, the berries that you use to pay for it actually go to another player. And that gives the player a pretty strong opportunity to make points in the game and to get a really big jump in resources, specifically berries. Uh, the next one is the Teacher, which is located just to the right of it. And when you draw two cards, you can keep one of them and give the other opponent, or one of your opponents, one of the cards. This is also like giving your opponent a resource. Some players kind of like this. I kind of tend to stay away from it. I've seen time and time again, especially playing the Shepherd down, you give one of your opponents a pretty decent boost in resources, and they can uh, run away with that for, you know, a few turns, or at a minimum, they get a decent critter out. In, in conjunction with that is the Chapel. So you play the Chapel uh, with the Shepherd in general. Now the frequency of the Shepherd and the frequency of the Chapel is only two, so there's two per deck. So to get that combo synergy to work, it just doesn't work all that well. So in general, um, I tend to stay away from these cards, uh, but if you like using them, that's great. It's just understand that there's some limitations to them. The Queen and the Inn are two great cards that you can use throughout the game, and I kind of recommend getting these out into the game earlier. You're going to place a critter on them to activate, and they both kind of have a similar theme. If you play the Queen, you can play one card up to three for free, which is fantastic. That can be from your hand, or that can be from the meadow. The Inn, you kind of do the same thing. You place one of your, ma your meeples on the Inn, and then you can play a critter or a construction from the meadow for three fewer less wild resources. So that's a that's a pretty big jump. So whichever one of these you decide to pick, try to get them out a little bit earlier in the game. Um, they're both obviously, well, the, the queen is very expensive. The inn is actually not that expensive. The one downside to the inn is that it's an open position, which means that any player can place a meeple on the inn, which makes it a, a little bit more competitive. Uh, they can place it on your land and reap those benefits, so just be careful of that. But these are two cards I recommend getting out early in the game. Here's a quick note on the Wanderer, and a lot of players don't notice this. The Wanderer gives you one victory point, and you can draw three cards when you bring it out. But the cool thing about the Wanderer, it doesn't count up as a space in your city, so you can place it off to the side. So feel free to play the Wanderer throughout the course of the game. If you have just a couple extra berries, you need that burst of cards. It doesn't take up a slot in your city. So that's really important to remember. Um, and so I highly recommend playing this card. It's cheap and it's pretty effective at card drawing and it doesn't mess up your city. Now that you have a pretty good understanding of at least a lot of the decent cards in the game, I'm not going to go through each and every card. Um, there's a lot of them I went over that are sort of intermediate cards. They don't really give you a sizable advantage. Um, they're not sort of clunky to play. They're just kind of in the middle. So I'll you know, kind of let you explore those cards on your own and figure out which ones work best for you. There's a lot of those cards that you play um, pretty often in, in any of the games, and they're okay. They're kind of situational. And, and that's fine. But now let's move into the late game. So when you're hitting Autumn, what you're really trying to do is not generate necessarily a ton of resources, but you're trying to spend all of those meeples to gain things like events and special events. In conjunction with that, playing some of these purple prosperity cards are a great way to sort of close out the game and give you that really big rush and that surge of points. As an example is the Evertree, and this one is a fantastic card. It gives you five victory points, but something else that it gives you is that you get one extra victory point for every other purple prosperity card that you have in the game, which is fantastic. Then the other thing which most people miss is that the Evertree, you can play down any critter, absolutely anything. So that's a really great late game card to play. Maybe you've got a king or a queen, or the king or the queen is hanging out in the meadow. You play the Evertree down, and the next turn you can play a free uh, king or queen. So a lot of these purple prosperity cards are really built for the end of the game. So they give you these bonuses uh, at the very end. So like the palace, for instance, for each unique construction, you get a victory point at the end of the game. Um, for each common construction, for the castle, you also get a victory point. So spend your last turn 
trying to amass as many victory points as possible, it's not really a great time to be, you know, building those resource pools. The, you know, the last season is really when you want to spend and take advantage of those events, the special events in the game, and also things like the um, the journey, which is I'll show you on the next part. Um, and you can gain a lot of victory points off of that. So I'll go through that real quick. As you're closing out the game of Everdell, you have the option to play down Meeples on the Journey. And this is located uh, at the bottom left corner of the Everdell board. And if you look at it, you can get rid of cards from your hand, place a Meeple down, and then you're going to gain those, those victory points. It's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty cost-effective, too. So especially if you're in the last part of the game, you have maybe three, four, five cards extra in your hand. You really don't need to use those. Throw a meeple down on the board and gain those uh, cards. Something else that I want to mention is that, let's say you're lucky enough to have a full hand of cards. You can throw a meeple down on the five. You can also throw a meeple down on the three. You can take two of those locations and gain eight victory points. So don't be shy to take advantage of that on your last turn. Use up your meeples, eight points on the last turn. That's that's a pretty hefty surge. So go ahead and think about that. The number two position allows for multiple meeples to be placed by uh, multiple players. However, these are the unique locations where you can only have one meeple present on each one. So be careful and try to soak up the three, four, and five as soon as possible so your opponents don't get them. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video on Everdell. I've shown you a collection of cards, not all of them in the game, but ones that I really like using and I think it gives you a nice point advantage in the game and it gives you some clear solid strategies to work around. So once you start mastering some of the core concepts, some of the stuff that I've provided in this video, you'll start seeing that the game of Everdell will open up for you. You'll start seeing combinations and ways to play the game beyond what I've shown you. Um, one of the most exciting parts of this game is when you get into those really crazy seasons where you're playing cards down, you're playing cards down, you're playing cards down, you almost feel like you're unstoppable and you can just keep going and going and going. Your opponents are progressing into the later seasons of the game and oftentimes you can be in, in you know, winter or spring and they've passed one or two seasons ahead of you and that gives you a pretty sizable advantage. So when you're playing the game too, I also want to give you a recommendation. Play it kind of for you. Compete against yourself. This sounds a little bit strange, but the first time you play it, um, maybe go for a certain point total. And then on the next game, try to beat your score. Um, don't get too caught up in trying to beat and uh, win against every other person at the table. If you focus on kind of yourself and building a strategy for yourself, you'll see that you, you'll be more competitive naturally because you're learning the game and you're also having a little bit more fun. So don't get too caught up in the competition. Everdell's a great game. It's a lot of fun. Um, take it kind of slow when you play the first couple games. Absorb it and learn it. Uh, read everything that you can. Read every card that, that you can. Understand what each and everything does. And you'll start seeing opportunities to, to make really cool plays and have really cool turns in this game. I want to thank you, as always, for spending your time with me, and I hope you had fun, and I hope to see you in the future.